Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks about the Chris Watts murders and specifically about how the affair that he was involved in seemed to contribute to the murder. So really, I received a lot of questions asking about Nicole Kessinger's role and what kind of dynamics could have been at play there that, again, may have contributed to these horrible homicides that Chris Watts committed. Now, whenever we're talking about causality, why people do things, it's very difficult to nail down. I'm just really speculating about what could have been happening with people in this situation. I'm not diagnosing Chris Watts or diagnosing Nicole Kessinger or anybody else. Really just speculating based on available evidence. And this really brings me to an important point. The available evidence in this case is really not great. There's a lot of unreliable sources, and the largest one, of course, is Chris Watts himself. Because he lied so much in this case, there's no way to know if he's really telling the truth or not. So it's kind of a difficult situation when it comes to the credibility of all these different stories and how we weigh this different evidence we see in this case. So I'm going to give a quick summary of the case. A lot of people are familiar with it, but just as an overview, we see that Chris Watts, age 33, and Nicole Kessinger, age 30, start an affair sometime in late June, early July of 2018. And that affair continued until mid-August of 2018. And that's when Chris Watts murdered his wife, an unborn child, and his two daughters. And after this, police interviewed Nicole Kessinger, the mistress, and she denied having any involvement, and it is important to note that she was never charged with anything. Now, Chris Watts, of course, was charged after confessing to the murder of his wife, and then later on confessing to all the murders. And he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole, and he's serving that right now in Wisconsin. He's serving a sentence in a prison in Wisconsin. So that's kind of a quick summary of the case. And we see an interview of Chris that law enforcement carried out in March of 2018. And they found him to be somewhat credible in that interview. And some of that information here kind of comes from that interview. But I'm still on the fence. I mean, he had a lot of time to kind of craft lies while in prison. And it's not clear why he would be honest at this point. Although it's also not perfectly clear why he would be dishonest. And I don't think that law enforcement are really in the best position to decide who's lying or not. We know from the research literature that really nobody's good at determining if somebody's lying or not, and sometimes law enforcement officers believe they have superior abilities in this area, but again, evidence shows that they do not. So just because they found them to be credible, that doesn't really mean a lot to me as a scientist. So again, we have a lot of unreliable information, but some of the facts of the case, of course, have been established. Nicole Kessinger and Chris Watts had an affair, and Chris Watts murdered his family. Those things we know for sure. So getting back to the original question, a lot of people are interested in the dynamics here and how this affair seemed to really motivate or push Chris to these bad acts. And it didn't really seem to affect Nicole in the same way. Obviously, she wasn't clearly involved in the crime. She wasn't charged, so it doesn't appear like she was involved. And she seemed much more indifferent to the relationship than did Chris. So one theory here kind of revolves around vulnerable narcissism. I touched on this in a prior video. This idea that Chris Watts was actually socially awkward and shy. Now I'm a little skeptical that he really fits this category enough to meet these particular criteria, but these constructs are on a continuum and we do know that vulnerable narcissism tends to oscillate back and forth between that vulnerable state and a grandiose state of narcissism. So everything's on a continuum, and with this movement back and forth, it could be that at times he was socially awkward and shy. Nicole described him in an interview with police as an introvert, but not extremely introverted. And usually when we use the term socially awkward or shy, we are talking about a little bit more of an extreme version of introversion or low extroversion. So anyway, under this theory, he has characteristics consistent with vulnerable narcissism, and Nicole Kessinger manipulated him, not necessarily to commit murder, but unintentionally manipulated him and kind of 
moved him in this direction of being homicidal. So the analogy that kind of comes up here that I think is appropriate, and this is how some people conceptualize it, is that, like, say there's like a beautiful actress, and she's very wealthy and very successful, and she's been in a lot of movies, and she kind of picks a sad, lonely, socially awkward guy who doesn't really stand out for many positive reasons, right? He's not kind of at the same level with acting or fame or anything, but even for other achievements, he doesn't really stand out. And she decides to start dating him. What would a person, what would the man in that situation do? Right? In a sense, the beautiful actress could manipulate that man without even trying because the status level is so different, or the apparent status level is so different. Now, I know Nicole Kessinger was not a Hollywood actress or anything like that, but that's kind of the analogy as people have described it to me when they say, well, this is maybe touching on what happened is that she had a lot of power in this relationship because she was very attractive and Chris didn't think of himself as attractive so it creates a gap more similar to kind of the sad lonely guy and the beautiful actress that's what I really mean here it's an analogy not what directly happened with Nicole and Chris and he did mention that Nicole appeared to pursue him and the evidence is pretty clear about their sexual activity they had a lot of sex about four or five times a week they met and who knows how many sexual encounters that involved and we also saw that Nicole sent Chris semi-nude photos. So I'm a little kind of torn on this theory, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment here, that this idea that Nicole was really kind of nonchalant and not invested in the relationship, and Chris was head over heels. The evidence doesn't support this completely, but there are a few important factors to consider, and that's what I'm going to talk about here next. So the factors involved in their affair relationship were actually pretty interesting, and there's several of them. And we see here that the first one to stand out would be immaturity on both Nicole's part and on the part of Chris Watts. Now, you get this sense from the interview with Nicole that maybe she was more experienced in relationships than was Chris. Now, Chris has said in interviews that he did not have a lot of experience with women. He didn't have a lot of experience with dating. So he does kind of seem more naive, and she seems more experienced, even though she's younger. So immaturity and inexperience, I think, is one factor to consider. The next factor here is they were in a passionate phase of a relationship. And this is a really dangerous phase, right? I consider this the phase of bad decisions. If you break up romantic relationships into a passionate and compassionate phase, sometimes called a companion phase, we see that the passionate phase occurs early, and it's really characterized by, again, bad decisions and impulsivity. And affairs only have the fantasy that comes with the passionate phase. They have the excitement. They don't have any depth or meaning, right? So when we see, when we look at the evidence, we see when people have affairs and they do end up together, they both leave their spouses or whatever and end up together, they rarely stay together because there's no depth, there's no sensitivity or meaning or really purpose in that relationship. Affairs are shallow and again all passionate. But this passionate phase has a lot of power. As a matter of fact, some people only want to be in the passionate phase of a relationship. So when that passionate phase ends, they leave that relationship and go to another new relationship. They only want new relationships. We see that the passionate phase is intoxicating. Someone has an intense longing and emotional pain and we also see that the reciprocated love, and this is in the research literature, and I'll put those references in the description of this video, the reciprocated love is associated with fulfillment and ecstasy, and unrequited love, which here is really referring to separation when people can't be together, we see this is characterized by emptiness, anxiety, and despair, all of which are actually fairly powerful motivators. Now, usually when I use the term unrequited love, I'm talking about a romantic relationship where one person believes they love the other and the other person doesn't love them back. But as I mentioned, unrequited love in this context is referring to separation. Or it could also be the thought of separation, which I think could have been at work here between Chris and Nicole. He was worried that they would be separated. Another thing we see with this phase is one person idealizes the other, right? So in these type of romantic relationships that are new, especially in affairs, the two people look at each other as being ideal, 
And we see this really on both sides, from Chris's perspective and from Nicole's perspective. I mentioned before there was a lot of sex here, and that's a characteristic of the passionate phase. And another thing I've seen about the passionate phase is for people that are involved in it, facts aren't really important, right? Objective evidence and critical thinking go out the window. They're really not even a part of the passionate phase, especially when infidelity is involved. So we see, again, immaturity, being inexperienced, the passionate phase, and then the last part here of these major factors would be impulsivity. And we see a lot of evidence that really both have some impulsivity issues, but especially Chris Watts. He seems particularly impulsive, although some would argue that he premeditated these murders and maybe he wasn't impulsive. But running under the theory that he was, two of the aspects of impulsivity would be negative urgency and positive urgency. So negative urgency is when somebody has really negative emotions, like if somebody is depressed and they act on those negative emotions. And positive urgency is when somebody has positive emotions, like euphoria, which it seems like Chris had. So if the murders weren't premeditated, it would make sense that they were the product of positive urgency. He had these positive emotions, and he was impulsive and acted on them. Now, there could have also been some negative urgency as well, like fear and anxiety. That's important to keep in mind. So I've covered these factors. I also want to mention this idea that it was intentional. So I talked about how the manipulation or the power differential may have been unintentional. So Nicole may have been really uninterested in the relationship, and Chris was overly interested, and that created a power differential. But it also could have been intentional pressure. It could have been really an ultimatum, where Nicole was demanding a decision. We don't see clear evidence of this, though. Like, there weren't any text messages or anything that I saw that indicated she was demanding he kind of decide what he was going to do. But we do see some interesting searches on Google. I mentioned these before in another video, like looking for a wedding dress. And Googling the search term, man I'm having an affair with says he will leave his wife. So there could have been an intentional component, or maybe not. And I'll talk about that next in Dynamics, kind of how this could have played out, either unintentionally or intentionally, that created this power differential, and how it may have led to these crimes. So when talking about the dynamics, we have to take a look at Nicole Kessinger's story, right? Her story, after all this happened, when she talked to police, was that she was lied to, and that Chris indicated that he was separating and then divorcing, which is kind of typical for men in affairs like this. It wouldn't be hard to imagine somebody in this situation saying that. They don't want to lose the potential relationship. They want to make sure they start off with a chance. So they say something like, oh yeah, I'm getting divorced. So this part of her story to me really holds together. This makes sense that initially she was lied to, and it more or less makes sense that she was lied to on an ongoing basis, but I'll talk about that a little bit. The part that makes me wonder about this is that, again, she was searching about men leaving their wives for a mistress. She indicated in a text message to a friend that she might always be in second place. So it does seem like she was really acknowledging this was an affair, but yet in the police interview, she almost seems shocked and surprised that anyone would consider this an affair. Now, she doesn't say that, but it's just the impression you get when listening to, I think it was a couple hours of interview, this idea that she was casually in this relationship, although she had some hopes about its potential, and maybe she never really categorized it in her mind as an affair. But again, the evidence points to this idea that she did understand it was an affair. So we have kind of, I think, mixed signals here. It seems like she knew but maybe was in denial. But in her interview, if you listen to the whole interview, she does appear somewhat credible. Now, that's just listening to just this two-hour segment, and that's not a lot of evidence to go on. And again, we have to be careful about how we weigh that evidence. But one thing I think was clear, she might have been credible, but the clear part was that she was immature. She seems to be quite immature. And she was clearly trying to distance herself from the whole situation, but again, I think this is somewhat understandable. She was being defensive because she didn't want to be implicated in these murders. You almost get this sense from the recording that she's trying to portray herself as the victim, like she was manipulated. And again, they were dating and not really in an affair because he was leaving his wife. But it's kind of a hard sell, right? If we look at the evidence, I'm not sure I really believe her account uh, exactly. 
Again, there was a lot of sex. They spent a lot of time talking, going places. I find it hard to believe that she couldn't see the truth through all these various interactions. Now, you know, maybe it's one of these things where she knew or should have known, right? So again, maybe the denial played a role and kind of blocked her from seeing the truth, but I'm not sure. I think that this idea that she was a victim and she was manipulated by him is somewhat believable, but again, it's kind of a hard sell based on the evidence we have available now, which might be the, all the evidence we ever get in this particular case. One thing, though, is for certain here. Someone's lying. So if you look at the story of Nicole Kessinger and you look at the story of Chris Watts, somebody wasn't telling the truth. Maybe both of them weren't telling the truth. And I think probably for most people, it makes sense that Chris Watts was lying based on the fact that he committed those murders. So I think it, in some sense, makes sense to say, well, he was lying, so we'll give Nicole Kessinger the benefit of the doubt. I know some people don't feel that way, but if I had to pick a position, if I had to really be definitive, I would say that I'm more skeptical about his statements than I am about hers. So with all this as kind of a theory behind his motivation, what happened here? So if all these things were kind of true, if Nicole was distant and in a position of power that was kind of artificially inflated by Chris's inexperience, what was the mechanism? What actually happened? Well, it could be that he started to feel pressure. He started to feel like he was going to lose her if he didn't make some sort of bold move to break free from his family life. And essentially, he breaks, which is consistent with this story he tells that he snapped. So again, this kind of goes to whether he did snap or whether it was premeditated, which is a whole other discussion. But under this theory, he snaps. He can't lose Nicole. She's become something that is not optional to him, which is a very dangerous way to think about another person. When you start to think of another person as a possession, that's a bad warning sign. So in essence, in his mind, maybe he had something he could not face losing. So the relationship became functionally manipulative, even if it wasn't Nicole's intention to make it manipulative. So it was really manipulative, in a sense, because of what Chris was doing. The self-deception, which is consistent with narcissism, kind of took over and led him to a very dark and tragic place. One of the key mysteries in this case is why Chris selected that particular day in August, it was August 13th, 2018, to commit the murders. Why not just continue the affair indefinitely or until something happened and everybody found out and there would be a lot of screaming and yelling, but nobody would have been killed. Maybe he was being pushed again internally because he put himself in a situation where he really had to be with Nicole. I kind of mentioned that before. This did appear to be his ultimate objective. So if we look at kind of the theory of these murders, the affair, I don't think, can be minimized. I actually think it was a major component. The affair and the mechanisms we see with immaturity and impulsivity and the passionate phase and all that, combined with Chris's situation and his really poor judgment, led to these crimes. Again, we don't know this for sure, but I think the affair played a major role. I think when you look at this whole case, you're left thinking if the affair had never happened, the murders probably would not have happened either. But again, we can't really go back in time and change things and see what would have happened if circumstances were different. So we're left trying to kind of solve this mystery and kind of think this thing through with the information we have available. I do think that this case, including the affair component, brings a lot of interesting discussion on mental health and personality, and I think it is important we understand why people commit crimes like the crimes that Chris Watts committed. So I know whenever I talk about this case, or really murders in general, there are a lot of different opinions. Some people may agree or disagree with me or have other opinions. Please put those opinions in the comments section. I think this always creates really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this descriptions of the Watts family murder and how the affair could have played a role to be interesting. Thanks for watching.